everyone. I'm Dina. And I'm Charlotte. Welcome to the Grim Curriculum Extra Credit. How the heck are you, Charlotte? I'm not doing too bad. It's been a good weekend so far. As of recording today, it is the 1st of October, and it's been a really freaking nice autumn day. I've been vibing. I have been seeing all the Buffy photos lately, and I am loving them. Oh, man, she's so photogenic when I'm sitting outside having a little smoke. um, She's just sitting there and the wind's in her hair. And I'm like, (laughs) people need to know about this. She's a beautiful dog. I mean, really. Oh, man, couldn't couldn't be prettier, honestly. (laughs) Now, it's time to talk about someone who is not behaving very pretty. Yeah, you might have seen her name in the news. I honestly had not heard about this case before her trial became so crazy taylor shabiznes let's talk about it (laughs) miss shabiznes all right so we are going to talk about the uh the crime a little bit here just for those of you who don't know so on february 21st 2022 uh miss shabiznes picked up her boyfriend shad from her mother's home around 9 30 that night they went to an apartment with a friend and the three of them had some fun you know they smoked some weed uh at some point apparently they did smoke methamphetamine and inject trazodone so that's quite the cocktail of drugs holy shit that's one hell of a night i mean that's pretty intense Taylor and Shad went to her mother's home and they spent the day together while his mother was away. At uh, one point of that day, they were uh, doing what people in love do and they were using chains to choke each other as foreplay. I mean, we, we've talked about this before, power to you to do what you want to do in the privacy of your own home. But unfortunately, in this case, it was not done safely. And as we'll find out, this is on purpose. But for y'all, just be safe when you're yeah, messing around. Be safe, because um, this was not. They, at some point, decided to put the chains on each other, and Shad laid face down in bed. Uh, that was when Taylor went, quote-unquote, crazy and started choking him, despite the fact that he was coughing up blood and he was turning purple at that point. Uh, to just give you guys an idea of what these chains look like, they were like choke chains for dogs. That's what we're dealing with here. Yeah, and here's the thing with uh, Miss Shabiznes is she told law enforcement everything afterwards. So she decided after he died that, um, you know, she was still in the mood and she kept having sex with him uh, despite the fact that he was dead. She went and uh, stopped doing that and got a bunch of knives and wanted to cut off his body parts and keep them, but didn't because she got lazy. And those are her words. Which is wild. And this is all corroborated also by the medical examiner. If you guys check it out on YouTube, there are videos, court videos out there of, of the entire trial. And the medical examiner does a very good job of explaining exactly what went on here. And the court videos are fascinating. Like, if you've got some time to kill and uh, you want to hear about this crazy stuff, it, it's all up there on the internet. And she is a horrifying human being. Yeah, she's quite crazy. And there's a lot of theories so far about her mental stability. She has been assessed, I believe, by mental health professionals. There's some theories about whether or not she is clinically insane. Most people think probably not. The jury thought probably not. (laughs) And uh, I mean, they're calling her the Lady Dahmer, which I am 100% on board with that name because After she did all of this stuff, she got a bucket and a tote bag to collect his blood. And uh, then she showered with that blood. She decapitated him. She dismembered him. She cut his abdomen numerous times and removed a large portion of his organs one by one. The medical examiner said that one of his feet had been shoved into his chest cavity and that his back was filleted. This is such a massive escalation right off the bat for her quote unquote first offense in this particular area. She's giving me almost Catherine Knight vibes, honestly. She really is. And the tragic part about all of this, if it already isn't bad enough, is that his poor mother was the one who discovered this. 
Because Taylor disposed or at least kind of got rid of most of his body, but she said she got lazy and left his head in the bucket with his genitals. And yeah, his mom came across it in her basement. She had been previously convicted of other charges that weren't related to this, fleeing, eluding, and obstructing a police officer. She had spent three months in jail. She had just gotten out like the month before all of this happened. She, at the time, had a GPS tracker on her ankle that she ended up removing, but they were able to get her. She said that she blacked out while all of this was happening, but then she also said that she regained consciousness and thought, you know what, I've already done this this much so I should just keep going you can stop anytime sweetie you don't have to keep going oh my god and she's saying right she's saying like hey it took him about five minutes to die he kept coughing up blood but she wanted to see what would happen and she asked detectives if they knew what it was like to love something so much that you kill it and also that they would have fun finding all of the organs or at least trying to I wonder if when she killed him initially by strangulation with the chain around his neck, if she thought, okay, I have murdered him. If I'm going to have any chance of potentially getting out of this, I have to go crazy so that I can get some kind of insanity plea going on. Because her behavior has been pretty wild the entire time she threw a chair at someone that was trying to assess her mental stability. She's famously seen wearing the spit hood around her face because they're worried that she's going to bite or, you know, attack people or spit at them. And there's reason for that because she attacked her previous lawyer. She straight up got out of her chair and attacked him. That really lends to the idea that is she pretending to be this volatile, neurotic, psychotic person or is it for real? Like, did she really snap? It's wild to see her in court when she doesn't have the giant spit mask on her. She's like smirking and she looks like she's laughing at some points, especially when she's talking about the crimes. She doesn't seem to have any regret at any point. There was one point where they were talking about whether or not jurors should be shown the photos of his decapitated head and uh, she just started laughing. I saw that they were debating whether or not it would be relevant to prove anything to the jurors. And yeah, she's straight up kind of cackling. And even at one point, she kind of makes finger guns towards the judge as they're kind of setting up for that session as well. I can't tell because it's almost like her behavior is so escalated and so over the top that it makes me wonder, like, are you being for real Or is there something really wrong with her? Because there's other points where she seems perfectly normal. Bearing in mind at the time of the murder, they were on quite the cocktail of drugs, like we said. That altered mental state. I mean, could she have blacked out? Potentially. I'm getting Carla Faye Tucker vibes. And I'm curious to see how she's going to react when she is incarcerated. Because she was sentenced to life in prison without parole. And uh, she was also sentenced to an additional seven and a half years for mutilating a corpse and three years for third degree sexual assault, which I find interesting. So she's going to be in jail for a long time and they are going to try to appeal it. We already know that. Here's what's interesting, though, is her judge is saying, and this is a quote. I really feel that this young lady should be given a chance at the possibility, not the probability, of getting out on extended supervision or parole someday after decades of work therapy and counseling. Yeah, I don't know about that. Although she is only 25 years old. She's not that old at all. Although I will say she looks older than 25 in the court videos. She's scary. She is quite scary. I Um, would not fuck with her. I am curious to see how they're going to try to appeal this because one of the things that her lawyer is saying is... Should the judge have even been on the case after he saw her fight the former lawyer? Because it's hard to have an open mind when it comes to someone when they're acting like that. And this is not my opinion. That's what her lawyer is saying. He's also saying that I heard she tried to flash the judge in court. Would that be another reason to get somebody else, another judicial officer? I have no idea. There could be a point there. My worry would be that if she's going to act crazy every time she's got a new 
judge in court, they're going to run out of judges pretty damn fast. Well, they're trying for a mistrial, or at least that's what they were doing before she got sentenced. And it's good to see that that didn't happen, that she did get sentenced. And I think that the sentence is more than fair. Yep, I think so too. It was absolutely horrific what she did, and I would not wish that on anybody, and she acted quite crazy. Yeah, We're going to follow her uh, journey, though, in jail, and uh, we'll talk about her again soon, Miss Taylor Shabusiness. On a slightly, I guess, more lighthearted note, perhaps this story will be cathartic for some of you listening. It is still grim in the sense it does involve death, well, here, let me let me get to the headline. Finally kicked the bucket. Daughter writes brutally honest obituary about dead dad. And this is a story coming from British Columbia as well. So close to home for us. I'm excited for this. As we all know, usually obituaries come from the family members or even friends of a passed on loved one, usually saying the wonderful things about the person as they lived and they'll be missed sorely and who they leave behind and all that good stuff. This was quite the opposite. Amanda Denis of Ontario said her dad, who lived in Penticton, British Columbia, he died at the age of 74. And the obituary begins with, I am pleased to announce the passing of my father. So (laughs) savage, right off the bat. (laughs) She goes on to say, After suffering multiple strokes, one, thankfully leaving him unable to speak, the abusive, narcissistic, absentee father, husband, brother, and son finally kicked the bucket. Because he treated people with disdain, there will be no service. Oh my god. Add a girl, Amanda. You know what? This may seem very, very hurtful, and you might be like, oh my god, where is she coming from here? But- His behavior is corroborated by other family members who completely agree with her. I'm just saying, I've talked about this a couple times on the show. I uh, do not have a relationship with my father. I am not fond of him. And uh, I want to find this girl and just give her a fucking high five. Right. I think a lot of people really commiserated with Amanda on this story. There's probably a few relatives out there where you wish you could have written a heartfelt true obituary about them. She tried to post the obituary on the funeral home website where her father was cremated, but they actually removed it. And she was a little upset about that because (gasps) she feels like it's important to be open and honest about your feelings and not all parents are good and that's okay. And we should be talking about this. She says, my father was absent. He was abusive. He was narcissistic. And she doesn't feel like they should have removed it from their website. Honestly, like, fuck around and find out. If you spend your entire life treating your family like shit, don't be surprised that after you die, they're not going to lie about how great you were. And I completely agree with her in that sense. I feel like there's a lot that goes left unsaid before funerals. There's a lot that we say at funerals and eulogies and stuff that a lot of the times we should have been saying to the people while they were still with us. Mm -hmm. And For the most part, we think of those things like, oh, I should have told that person I loved them more. I I should have complimented so-and-so more. I should have done this. But in this case, it's like, no, you should have told them that they were a piece of shit while they were living. And I'm sorry that you didn't get that opportunity, but I'm glad that you could still get it off your chest in the end. You know, everyone grieves in their own way, and uh, I'm sure she needed this. Yeah, absolutely. She did say that in lieu of flowers, she's just asking people to be kinder to one another because her father was not while he was alive. And when asked how she thought he might have responded to the letter, she says, I don't think he would care. Honestly, that's just (laughs) the type of person he was. Oh, my God. (laughs) Not all the time are you grieved after you're gone. And I think that's how it should be if you were a nasty person. Well, we've talked about obituaries time and time again on the show. One that comes to mind is Dennis DePew, who we just covered, where in his obituary, it didn't talk about the fact that he killed his wife and spent a year on the run or any of that. It just said all the good stuff about him when really he was a wife killer. And I I don't think you should really get an obituary if you were a nasty person in some sense. This also made me look up how much it actually costs to have an obituary. I've said obituary so many times, but (laughs) 
how much it actually costs to have one published in, say, your local newspaper. And I was shocked, actually, at how expensive it actually is. How much? It says, uh, and this is just for Canada. I looked up how much does an obituary usually cost in Canada. It says a short obituary can easily cost 200 to $600, where a long detailed one can cost upwards of 1000 Families usually include a high quality photo of their deceased loved one, which will also contribute to the bottom line. So you could be talking around $1,200. For someone you didn't even like while they were alive. Potentially, yeah. I'm so cynical today, but I mean, really, though. I wonder if obituaries are one of those things that perhaps millennials are going to get accused of ruining one day, because I feel like people are not willing to spend that kind of money anymore. And certainly, I hope that I go to my grave being beloved and, you know, having friends and family members that will miss me. But I would not want them to spend that kind of money on something frivolous like that. Especially if they were just lying. Well, that too. (laughs) So yes, I suppose, if nothing else, this is a lesson to be kinder to one another while you're here on this earth. And if you're not, your loved ones may talk shit about you. (laughs) And they have every right to. 100%. All right, so for our next story, we are taking it back to, surprise, surprise, Florida. Oh, classic Florida. Now, is this a Florida man or a Florida woman story? It's a Florida otter story. Oh, my goodness. Otters. All right. So this was just last month. Joseph Scaglioni, 74, was uh, feeding the birds behind his house. And, you know, that's something he usually does. He's older. He likes to relax. All of a sudden, all the birds started to scatter. And he was like, oh, my goodness, what's going on? Is it a hawk or something? He looks up, he looks down, and he sees a little brown head sticking up over the bank of the pond. Now, this is Florida. I would be concerned that it was a little scaly crocodile or rather alligator head poking out of the pond. Which is fair. He he knew like this guy has been in Florida for a long time. He knew not to turn his back on the animal. So Good call. he started kind of like walking backwards. He's trying to close the gate to his yard to block it. When all of a sudden this little otter pounced on him so hard that he fell to the ground. It bit him. 41 times on his legs hands and his wrists and would not let go oh my god it ravaged this poor man scaglioni wanted to fight back so he did he grabbed the otter by the throat and he tried to strangle it to death but it got away uh once it did get away though it attacked a dog who was on a walk with a couple and their baby and then just ran off one neighbor of his said one of my favorite things (laughs) she said Uh she got a video of it And it was like walking around and it was having trouble walking and it was like very obviously convulsing. Oh, dear. Was this a case of rabies then? Well, that's just it. She said, oh, it was so cute. We didn't want it to be rabid, but it just looked like there was something wrong. Like it was ill the way it was acting. Oh, the poor thing. And poor Mr. Scaglioni getting ravaged by an otter like that. Right? So they managed to capture the otter under a recycling bin and a rabies test was conducted. Sadly, the otter tested positive for rabies. They think he got it from an infected raccoon. And uh, Scaglioni is being treated for rabies and so is the dog that was bitten. The rabid otter was sadly euthanized because there is no cure for rabies that's that makes me very sad but it also makes me cringe for mr scaglioni because the treatment for rabies i believe is very nasty injections that are quite painful from what i understand and rabies is not something you want to fuck around with like you will die a terrible terrible death if you don't treat it fast enough It's not the way you want to go. And luckily, I don't think we see it too, too much these days because people tend to vaccinate their pets and stuff. But yeah, oh, poor rabbit little otter. I hate that. Seriously. The the family was like, oh, it was so cute. We didn't want it to be rabbit. But it was. Oh, poor thing. 
We've had a pretty busy week in the true crime world this week, and I'm so excited that we have this show where we can talk about this stuff because this is a case I've actually wanted to cover, and we might cover the whole case eventually, so I don't want to go over it too, too much here, but I want to talk about Gypsy Rose Blanchard. Now, this is a name that I had not heard before Dina brought it up to me today, and apparently it's quite a well-known and prolific case, so I'm excited to hear about it. Yeah, so there have been movies made about this story. There have been, obviously, her Dr. Phil interviews from when she was in the institution. But basically, what had happened was Gypsy Rose Blanchard was victim of her mother, who was suffering from Munchausen by proxy. Oh, I see. Okay. So what happened was on June 14th, 2015, deputies in Greene County, Missouri, found the body of Dee Dee Blanchard, who was her mother, face down in the bedroom of her house. She had been lying in a pool of her own blood and she had been stabbed numerous times days prior. And at this point, Gypsy was missing. This was a big deal because Gypsy had leukemia, asthma, muscular dystrophy. She had brain damage. She was using a wheelchair. At some point, she had different forms of cancer, but this was a very, very sick child. They had gotten a house from Habitat from Humanity. Dee Dee Blanchard had been constantly supported by her community with gifts, trips, the house, things like that. So she had this sick kid and everyone kind of came together and helped her out. After she had been killed, it turned out that Gypsy Rose had met a boy online and had convinced him to kill her mother. The crazy thing about all of this was that it turned out that there was absolutely nothing wrong with Gypsy. Munchausen's is such a rare and strange condition, and then Munchausen's by proxy is almost even stranger. I I can't even wrap my mind around it is what I'm trying to say. It's crazy. Well, the thing is, is she made her act like she was a lot younger than she was. She made her pretend to be physically and mentally disabled and chronically ill. This kid had numerous surgeries. She was on a huge amount of medication. She was being physically abused, psychologically abused. Like this is a nightmare. And I can't imagine being a child and being in this situation where everything around you is fake and you're going to these doctors and you're being made to lie about your symptoms. Otherwise, your mom is going to abuse you like that is there there are horror movies about this because this is a horror movie. Like, this is horrible. It's crazy to me how long these cases seem to go on for before they actually realize what's going on. You know, Gypsy Rose would have seen many, many doctors that never had a clue. Like, did no one suspect anything? And that's the thing is every time a doctor would suspect something, Dee Dee would just take her to a different doctor. Oh, I see. That makes a lot of sense. She planned this and this was a very strategic thing because, again, she got a friggin' house for all of this. She had her bills paid. She was taken care of because her kid was sick. So not only does she get the attention and all the sort of stuff that comes along with that, she's also financially benefiting from this situation as well. Absolutely. Like I said, Habitat for Humanity helped them out. The Ronald McDonald House did Make-A-Wish, Children's Mercy, like huge, huge charities. And what ended up happening was throughout all of this after it happened, Gypsy Rose, uh, she did plead guilty to second degree murder and was supposed to serve a 10 year sentence. But she was granted parole last month and is scheduled to be released in December. Again, this is earlier than originally expected. I am not going to to lie to you do I think that what she did was wrong absolutely but I also feel like this is someone who desperately needed help who never got it and I hope that she gets the help and treatment that she needs and that she can continue on and live at least somewhat of a normal life because she never has had a normal day in her life. I can understand to some degree how living in those conditions of psychological 
physical trauma and abuse that you might feel like the only way to get out of it is to kill your captor. And to that, do I wish that it had never gotten to the point where she felt like that was her only option? Of course. It, someone should have caught this along the line. Surely relatives or something. I, I don't know, man. This is so mind boggling. If this is a case you guys want to know more about, let us know the grim curriculum at gmail.com if you want us to cover this in uh, a full episode because this case is wild. It's a little bit newer than stuff that we usually cover, but it is a one of a kind story. And I recommend, if anything, that you watch her interviews because at the end of the day, she murdered her mother. But I feel so horrible for everything that this girl went through. Oh, yeah. Was the boyfriend? In this particular case, was he charged also? Yes, he was convicted of first degree murder and he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. So he is not getting out. However, they broke up at some point and she is now engaged to another man. Oh, wow. It really seems like he kind of got the shit end of the stick on that one. <laughs> yeah, apparently her uh, new beau was a pen pal of hers. She was getting a lot of letters and uh, this is the one that uh, stuck. Wow. Uh, the pen pals to prison, folks, I feel some kind of way about because while do I believe that, of course, inmates need company and things like that? By all means. Absolutely. If you're allowed to join a pen pal program, by all means, do so. But it's the weird, like, love interests in prison that I do not enjoy. Okay, I don't know if you get these on any of your feeds, but every now and again, I'll be scrolling and I get these, like, videos that are guys that are in jail and it is the pen pal programs and it's like hey i'm joe and i killed four women and i want you to write to me and like <laughs> i'm like where is this coming from i don't even want to know i mean i guess all the horrible stuff i look up i understand why it's in my algorithm but every single time i'm just like no 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 there's definitely websites out there that you can scroll through and there's uh, both female and male inmates that you can write to as well for pen pals. There's usually like a little bio and something about them. There's also um, inmates that write poetry and stuff too. So there's that. Whatever floats your boat, ma'am. Yeah, absolutely. I hope the best for Gypsy Rose. I hope that she's able to get the help she needs and that she is able to live a fairly normal life after this and sort of get back to a normal baseline. I hope so too. I, uh, again, don't agree with what she did, but I certainly wish her well. Absolutely. The last little story I have for you today from my side of things is not even particularly grim, but it is a sort of a fun little history piece that you might find interesting because I certainly did. This story is taking us all the way to Jerusalem and to Bethlehem. Mm. And it's about what is called the status quo. You may know status quo means, you know, everything is the same. Everything is balanced. And in this particular case, the status quo is referring to an understanding amongst the nine shared religious sites that are throughout Jerusalem and Bethlehem. And it's over the six religious orders of the area. These religious orders include Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, and as well, sort of Greek Orthodox, Latin Orthodox, and Armenian Orthodox as well. So what the status quo means is, in order for anything to change in these historical sites, all six orders have to agree. This isn't just laws, it's everything such as how many chairs are around a table in a particular museum. Oh my god. Uh, what art is on the walls, what books are on what bookshelves. Like it's right down to the nitty gritty, which makes me think of when I was little and me and my sister couldn't get along in the car. And so like I had my side of the car, like my <laughs> seat and she had hers and we weren't allowed to touch the other side. <laughs> I love that. That's so cute. But basically this, this is a law that goes back hundreds and hundreds of years and it goes all the way back to the year 1757 and the Ottoman Sultan Abdul Hamid I, he was like, okay, I've had enough of this bickering and ridiculousness. No one touches anything without everybody else agreeing. And they take it very freaking seriously. That is intense. That seems like so much work. 
It really is. And the one particular item that I want to talk about is colloquially known as the immovable ladder. Now, this ladder has been in the exact same place at the exact same window since 1757. This wooden ladder in the same place for all these hundreds of years. It's visible from the outside. It's at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. It is made of Lebanon cedar wood, and they reckon it could have been there initially since 1728, but it has remained there since 1757. Oh my god. Oh, is it bad that I just really want to touch it? Like, I would want to move it. (laughs) So we even have early photographs that they show that the ladder was there from the 1850s at least. But going all the way back, it's mentioned in tapestries and carvings. During his pilgrimage to the Holy Land in 1964, Pope Paul VI described the ladder as a visible symbol of Christian division. Basically, this is ridiculous. Y'all can't agree on nothing. (laughs) I love that. It was supposedly pulled in through the window and hidden in 1977 by a Protestant intending to make a point of like how stupid this argument was. But then it was returned to the ledge just a few weeks later and they put a grate over the window so that it couldn't be pulled inside anymore. Oh my goodness. In 2009, it was reputedly placed against the left window instead of the right window for a short period of time. And then it was moved back again. (laughs) They got a little wild there for a minute, didn't they? I guess so. So all this to say is that, yeah, not much changes in Jerusalem and Bethlehem without the complete and unanimous agreement of the six churches. My dumb ass would just like trip over something and move it and break it and be banned. And it would just not. It'd be like a friggin' Mr. Bean bit or something. Like, it would just be bad. Oh, can you imagine? I can already picture him climbing the ladder to, like, clean the windows or something and spill, (laughs) you know, water everywhere or whatever. There's been a lot of debate over even who the ledge that the ladder is on belongs to. And it's been used to grow vegetables over the years. It's been used as a place to sit during festivals. Um, But if you do Google it, it is quite high up. So I'm not sure how people climb up there, but there you have it. Huh. Yeah, so a little fun history fact for you today. You know, uh, one thing I just want to say about that is why so many rules? I just feel like that is, it's a bit much, isn't it? According to Wikipedia, this status quo ruling, it doesn't actually have any strict written guidelines everyone just kind of follows it it's just an accepted thing that happens but if you do get a little wacky with it you basically risk a holy war of sorts so people tend not to fuck around and find out i wouldn't want to anyways not not with them it seems like an intense bunch yes very much so And speaking of intense, that brings us to our latest and greatest strange and unusual death. It's that time of the episode again, folks. I'm taking us back to June 7th, 2011. Today's story, like many stories that I tell, has to do with a bear. Now, today's bear was not a regular bear. You see, he killed two people while they were riding around in their SUV on a rural road in Quebec because he was hit by a car and he flew through the air. He All 300 pounds of him flew through the air and onto this SUV, killing both the 25-year-old driver and the 40-year-old passenger. Holy cow. The two people who were in the car that originally hit the bear were fine. I don't even know what to say. Let me pull my fucking thoughts together. I'm like trying to picture this entire accident happening in my head. Can you imagine? You're just like on this rural road. There's the first car. It's driving. They hit this bear. And rather than just like, bleh, like just like fall over, the bear goes fucking flying into another car and kills two people. Holy that crap. That must have been some serious momentum. It like they really must have was. hit it going so fast. I do want to say the bear did not survive, but I feel like that is a shitty way to go. I am, again, horrified of bears, and the idea of a bear flying at me and then killing me when I least expected is a new fear that I didn't know I had. 
I mean, no one expects a grizzly through the windshield, that's for sure. Yeah. And speaking of grizzlies, do we want to talk about actually the recent death that just occurred here a couple of days ago in Banff? We might as well. Here you go, friends. A uh, two for one strange and unusual death for you. Yeah. So a Canadian couple and their dog were tragically killed by a grizzly bear in the same sort of theme, the grizzly bear was ordered to be euthanized. They were close to Banff National Park uh, here in Alberta, just west of the Yaha Tinder Ranch. And I was telling this to Dina before, I've actually spent some time at the Yaha Tinder Ranch. For you horsey people out there that love to go trail riding and stuff like that, it's an absolutely fantastic piece of paradise in the Rocky Mountains. It's absolutely gorgeous there, but it is known for its incredible wildlife like this grizzly. So Parks Canada was alerted via a GPS device, but due to shitty weather conditions, the response team wasn't able to bring in helicopters. So they had to drive through the night to reach, unfortunately, the deceased victims. And like I said, the bear was later euthanized for displaying aggressive behavior. Oh, that's so sad for everyone involved. I don't want to say especially the bear because it's sad for everybody, but it's It's a lose-lose situation. It really really is. is. Because I mean, at the end of the day, that bear was just in his house doing his bear stuff when these people came by, you know? Yeah, we do encroach more and more onto the wilderness every day. And it's unfortunate that... Humans and animals get hurt in these cases. If you're going out in the wilderness, guys, I cannot stress how important it is to have your bear bells and your bear spray and to know how to behave in the event of an encounter with wildlife. They are not pets. They will tear you the fuck up. And don't go out there looking to be friends with wildlife. Like, they don't want to have anything to do with you. You don't need to see them up close. Leave them alone. Big old grizzly Winnie the Pooh there can move a lot faster than you think his bumbling butt could move. Oh, yeah. All right. So that brings us to the end of this episode of the Grim Curriculum Extra Credit. Charlotte, was there anything else that we wanted to go over before we say goodbye to these lovely, lovely listeners of ours? (laughs) Uh, I don't think so. Um, Just as usual, you heard it before uh, probably a couple of times by now. We have a live show coming up December 9th, Felice Cafe here in Edmonton. More details will be released soon as soon as we can get them out to you. And ticket sales, we should be able to give you a date for those soon too. We're very freaking excited. It's wild that it's happening. I'm so excited. I think it's going to be the first of many and it's going to be amazing. For all of you out there that love vintage fashion, just a heads up, there will be somewhat of a theme if you'd care to follow it, but I will save that for when we announce some more stuff as well. Hell yeah. All right. So I think that's it today. I hope y'all at least learn something new. And if you have anything to add or any stories you'd like us to cover on Extra Credit or indeed our usual show, please send them to us at thegrimcurriculum at gmail.com or you can shoot us a message over on social media too. Yes, especially if you want to send us submissions for our latest Grim Encounters episode. We would love to hear your stories about experiences with the paranormal, the unexplained, or just the overall weird. And that email again is thegrimcurriculum at gmail.com. Yep, it is officially spooky October season now like i said we're october 1st as of recording so it's time for grim encounters and even better if we have some spooky ghost stories to talk about too and maybe we will read your story at our live show wouldn't that be cool hell yeah i would love that all right everyone thank you so 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 much for listening this has been the grim curriculum extra credit